Hello and welcome to St Bede's Catholic Church Hotham in South Yorkshire in the UK. This is the first of four sessions introducing the Gospel of Mark. I am John Ryan. It might be useful uh, before setting out on the second session to listen to Mark's Gospel. That after all is how the first audience would have come across this great work and various opportunities are available on YouTube. It would also be handy to have a copy of the Gospel as we go through it. Um, please use a study version of a literal translation such as the new RSV or the uh, new revised Jerusalem Bible. Um, and also uh, if you go to the St Bede's website then there's a glossary of terms I will be using which I don't want to need to explain every time and also a brief bibliography. The slides which uh, I'll be using are provided by BiblePlaces.com and are used with permission and with profound thanks. Let's then get down to the text itself. In this first session we'll be looking at some background material and the first 15 verses of Mark's Gospel. The Gospel of Mark, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. That is the first sentence of the Gospel. Now, in most translations, that's not quite what you see. What you would see in most, I think it's the international version, which is an exception uh, to this. You'd read the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, full stop. I'm suggesting that a better approach to this sentence is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ and of God as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. We have to remember that there was no punctuation, no paragraphing. The reader of the ancient text was faced with simply a block of uh, words. And it was a great skill on behalf of the reader to be able to make sense of this and to communicate it effectively. But without punctuation, then the first option, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ and of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, is perfectly acceptable. The second also is perfectly acceptable, but we have to note that the uh, citation which follows, I will send my messenger and onwards, is not directly from the prophet Isaiah, it's a mixed citation. The first part comes from the prophet Malachi with an allusion to the book of, a verse from the book of the Exodus. And then we have a quotation from the prophet Isaiah. And scholars differ as to explaining why this is so. Joel Marcus suggests that, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, is actually a bridge between what comes before and what comes after. And that would have been understood by the audience of the time. In English, that would be incredibly cumbersome. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, I will send my messenger. The point about this is that we are being directed by Mark at the very beginning to look at the prophecy of Isaiah. What he's actually saying to us is, stop now, leave this gospel um, and go and read the prophet Isaiah, then come back, pick up this gospel again, and you'll have a much better idea of what I'm telling you if you have the background of the prophet Isaiah in your minds. Because this good news of Jesus Christ was already foretold by the prophet Isaiah. Now, the book of Isaiah, scholars in modern times have concluded, 
though this is something which was not known to Mark or the people of his time, but it's actually very much a composite work and it arises from three different eras um, uh, in the ancient world. That first Isaiah, roughly speaking, chapters 1 to 39, is the 8th century prophet, the priest who had a vision uh, in the temple and a commissioning there when he felt himself to be completely unworthy and had his lips touched with charcoal from um, the censer, touched by the, uh, the cherubim. And that was a time when the Northern Kingdom was to be destroyed by the Syrians and they would indeed come to the very walls of Jerusalem uh, at the time of King Hezekiah, though they would be rebuffed by giving them lots of money to go away. Second Isaiah, and that's going to be of great interest to us, comes from the time of the exile in Babylon. An unknown author writing, as it were, in the style of Isaiah, continuing his thought processes, perhaps belonging to some sort of school, um, discipleship of, of Isaiah, uh, but he wrote from exile, uh, and we'll come back to what he tells us in a moment. Third Isaiah, uh, the final chapters, dates from uh, the post-exilic period when some of the people had returned uh, and uh, rebuilt the temple and the walls of Jerusalem at the time of Ezra and Hezekiah. Second Isaiah is concerned about good news. This is how that section begins from verse one of chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. For she has served her term, her penalty is paid. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Her sins were many and the comfort that she's going to receive is many too. And then a text which we're going to hear um, in Mark's gospel, uh, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and mountain be laid low. The ground has to be flattened out in order to create a super highway because a very important cavalcade is going to be progressing along that highway. So get you up uh, a high mountain of Zion, herald the good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Good tidings, good news. Uh, and the message here is your God. The one who's coming and the great cavalcade down the superhighway is God himself. And a little bit later uh, in chapter 52, uh, a passage known to all of us who sing hymns in church. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news. Who announces salvation, says to Zion, your God reigns. The sentinels lift up their voices, for they see the return of the Lord to Zion. The Lord who has bared his holy arm. Um, worth singing uh, about. The Lord is returning to Zion. The Lord God is coming. The Lord is the Greek word Kyrios, which was used to translate the Hebrew Adonai, which was a substitute for the sacred tetragrammaton, the sacred letters or consonants, uh, which translated the name of God given to Moses um, at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. Here again is the news brought by a servant. Um, and servant is going to be, and service is going to be an essential theme in Mark's gospel and indeed in all the gospels. And the servant is one who is oppressed, wounded, put down, um, stricken and afflicted, but uh, he is going to bring salvation to the people. This could be an individual, sometimes it seems to refer to an individual, sometimes it seems to be the whole of Israel who is being uh, personified in this way, but he is going to um, bear the iniquity of all the people. He'll be struck down, but he will bring um, salvation. By his wounds, we are healed. So this good news of second Isaiah, um, follows the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar's the second's forces and the exile in Babylon. There was um, a return. Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of the city. Um, the temple was rebuilt, uh, attributed to a descendant of David called Zerubbabel. 
um, a fine Babylonian name, but it wasn't quite what people had hoped for. Those who were old enough who could remember Solomon's temple didn't think it was a patch on what had gone before. Mainly, it seems, not because of its dimensions. The dimensions were laid down in the book of Leviticus, but because of the absence of gold. Uh, it would shimmer in the sunlight, but this temple did not. Though it would again when Herod um, reconstituted it, uh, rebuilt it massively. So there was a sense among the people that God, uh, yes, sacrifice had uh, returned to the temple. God's name was once again there, but hmm, the prophecy had to be completely fulfilled as yet. Um, God wasn't fully back in his temple. As uh, Tom Wright uh, writes, and he's one of the scholars who uh, presses this um, most fully, most Jews of this period, that's the first century, uh, when Mark is writing, would have answered the question, where are we, in language which reduced to its simplest form meant, we are still in exile. They believed that in all the senses which mattered, Israel's exile was still in progress. Although she had come back from Babylon, the glorious message of the prophets remained unfulfilled. Israel still remained in thrall to foreigners. Worse, Israel's God had not returned to Zion. The wait continues. The wait for God to come to his holy mountain Zion, to Jerusalem, his holy city. And then suddenly, at this very beginning of Mark's gospel, there is Jesus coming to the Jordan to be baptized by John. God is coming to his people. The Lord God is returning. And there stands Jesus awaiting baptism. Thus, Ricky Watts writes, thus for Mark, the reign of God that Jesus announces is none other than Yahweh's kingly intervention as it is written in Isaiah. For Mark, Israel's Lord is in some mysterious and unparalleled parallel sense present in Jesus. So let's now look at that mixed citation which follows that opening sentence, which has told us to look to Isaiah for the, to understand the good news uh, of Jesus Christ and of God. See, says the uh, quotation, see I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The first part coming from Malachi, but with a clear allusion to a verse in the book of the Exodus. And then the uh, text of Isaiah that we noted earlier, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Looking at uh, Malachi, the actual quotation, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of uh, the Hebrew Bible, translated in the second century BCE, mainly for the people of Alexandria, but then for the whole of the Jews in the diaspora who no longer uh, understood the sacred language Hebrew so needed a Bible, their sacred scriptures, in a language they could understand, Greek. See, I am sending my messenger to pray, prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. By the end of Mark's gospel, of course, Jesus will have visited and indeed cleansed the temple. Um, and the allusion to the book of Exodus, I'm going to send an angel in front of you to guard you on the way um, and to pray, bring you to the place I have prepared. What Mark writes in the first part of this mixed citation, see I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Um, the prophet uh, is speaking to the Lord God. The Lord God's way is being prepared. Malachi comes as the final book in the Christian Bible it's obviously among the prophets in the second part of the Tanakh, the uh, um, Hebrew Bible. And it um, concludes that the day of Yahweh will be preceded by the coming of Elijah, lest the people be unprepared. So it announces the coming of Elijah. And one of the reasons it's the final book of the Christian Bible is because it leads on to the beginning of the New Testament, um, and which opens, of course, with Matthew's Gospel. Um, and we hear early on of uh, 
John the Baptist, who is an Elijah-like figure, as he is in Mark. So some of the exiles had returned after Cyrus, uh, the uh, king of Persia, who had defeated the Babylonians, allowed the peoples, all the exiled peoples of uh, the empire to return to their places if they wished to return. Um, though there wasn't independence, the Persians still uh, wanted uh, everybody to know that they were in charge and continued to take tribute. But it was a hard time beset with locusts and drought. The wicked flourished, the righteous suffered, the old, old story. And doubts about the faithfulness of God openly stated. So in that context, Malachi affirms that God is going to come for certain. And repentance is needed. The um, response which Mark quotes is Malachi's answer to the question, where is the God of justice? And the message will come as a surprise and deal with priests and others who oppress widows. And of course, Jesus will throughout Mark's gospel be in conflict with priests and others, authorities of the people, and will hear of the oppression of widows when he reaches Jerusalem. The book of Exodus to which Malachi alludes is part of the book of the covenant, um, telling us what it means for Israel to be God's son, another important element in what we're going to see shortly, and his holy people. The people in Exodus had been led uh, out of slavery in Egypt, uh, across the wilderness uh, by cloud and fire, and henceforth, uh, God's messenger would guide, instruct and preserve them in the way. The way is going to be almost a technical term uh, for Mark. The presence of God and the messenger are related. My name is in him. So the messenger who is coming is going to be very closely related to God in Mark's view. Rejecting him is to reject God himself. And disobedience to um, God's law will bring judgment, as always. Then the text from uh, Isaiah, uh, which uh, follows on from that uh, text of Malachi. And we've seen it's uh, the beginning of 2nd Isaiah chapter 40. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Notice the parallelism uh, typical of Hebrew poetry in the wilderness, in the desert. Uh, prepare the way, make straight a highway um, of the Lord for our God. The different parts of, of um, each um, saying um, is in parallel with what follows. And so the Lord is God. Then in Mark's quotation of that, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, so the voice is now in the wilderness rather than the way of the Lord being prepared in the wilderness. Uh, that simply links in with uh, John, whom we're going to meet in a moment. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So the Lord for whom the paths must be straightened is the Lord God who is coming. And there suddenly is Jesus. Isaiah um, is concerned as is, is the book of Exodus concerned with the um, um, first deliverance of the people from slavery in Egypt and the giving of the law and then the entrance to the land. So Isaiah picks up this theme of a new Exodus and Mark continues developing that theme throughout his whole book. So um, if we, just for our purposes here, we'll look at the structure of Mark in a moment, but if we break Mark down into three broad sections. In the very beginning, the first half or so of the gospel, Jesus delivers Israel from the strong man, all the forces of evil. He'll be accused of being in league with Beelzebul, uh, but he's fighting evil in all its manifestations, in people possessed, in lepers, um, in uh, all the ways that evil flourishes in the world. Jesus is opposing that. And in Isaiah, God promises to deliver Israel from Babylon, the strong man of the age uh, for second Isaiah in exile. Then the next couple of chapters, um, Jesus will 
lead followers along a way they don't understand. The disciples in Mark are notoriously stupid and slow to get the message. In Isaiah, God leads his people in a path they do not know. The third part of um, Mark's gospel in this, this scheme is the journey's end at Jerusalem, where he goes through suffering and death. And in Isaiah, we hear of the return um, of the people through the suffering servant, who we just mentioned, to Jerusalem um, in those uh, three chapters. So the theme of the new exodus, so important to Isaiah, second Isaiah, is a major theme of Mark. And we'll be picking up on that as we go forward. So the whole citation introduces John, um, who is going to be an Elijah figure, as we'll see in a moment. John, the messenger, who is preparing the way for the stronger one, whom he announces. And the stronger one is God himself, Israel's warrior shepherd, who will bring salvation. But a warning implied in all of this, Israel's faithful, faithlessness has brought the need to a messenger. It was indeed Israel's faithlessness that led them um, to exile in Babylon after the destruction of Jerusalem. And the messenger calls repentance and for the forgiveness of sins. Um, that's the message of the citation, and that's what we're going to see uh, as we meet John the Baptist. The first prophetic voice since Malachi, uh, who ends our Christian Old Testament. So 500 years have passed and the heavens, as it were, have been shut closed, no voice of God. John brings to mind Elijah, the great northern prophet, the prophet of Israel. He's hairy. Um, Elijah was either a very hairy man or perhaps, depending on how it's translated, wore a hairy coat uh, with a leather belt. Um, John has a garment of camel skin and a leather belt. Both John and Elijah call for repentance. Both are wilderness prophets and both are concerned with the Jordan. Elijah will of course cross the Jordan before being carried up to heaven in a fiery chariot accompanied by his servant Elisha and John works baptizing, doing his thing uh, at the river Jordan. John is distinctive in terms of the food he eats, um, locusts and wild honey, um, very kosher, uh, very acceptable, no doubt very healthy too. And he immerses people in water. There were lots of immersions going on in the first century uh, in the Jewish world. Um, in Qumran, just down the Jordan on the north, uh, west coast of um, the Dead Sea, uh, Qumran associated with the Essenes, we'll meet them a little bit later. Um, they had ritual washings on a daily basis. Uh, the Jews required uh, washings before they could carry out certain functions in the temple to be ritually clean. Uh, but John, John seems to have been just a one-off. You were baptized once for the forgiveness of your sins and that made you ready um, for the fiery conflagration, which uh, John would promise in Matthew and in Luke, though not as it happens in Mark. The purpose explicitly stated of John's baptism was repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now we're going to just hold our look at the actual text there, just to um, look at some of the background to Mark. I'm not going to try and answer the question, who was Mark? Any commentary will go into the many arguments as to which particular Mark this might have been. Mark was a very common name in the ancient world. Um, and the conclusion is, we really don't know. Was it the John Mark of Acts of the Apostles, um, who um, Paul fell out with big time, and that led to his break with, uh, with Barnabas? We simply don't know. Um, so we call him Mark, and we know nothing at all for sure about his background. But when and where and why he wrote his groundbreaking work, 
we can surmise a little bit more. When in the 70s, perhaps later after the destruction of the temple by the forces of Titus, uh, who carried off the menorah as they spoils, of course, but may have been in the build-up uh, to the actual destruction, um, but during the Jewish revolt, uh, beginning in 66. The where, well, Rome's been a popular choice. Uh, PPS in the second century makes some comments about Mark being an interpreter of Peter, um, Richard Bachman um, uh, picks up and develops that line of thought. Um, um, Peter was, of course, executed, uh, so tradition tells us, fairly securely um, in Rome at the time of the persecutions of Nero. But others, uh, John Marcus and many others, think Syria, uh, a more likely place, uh, close to the events uh, happening in uh, Palestine, the Roman name for the Holy Land, uh, and indeed Jerusalem. Why did he write? Well, persecution is uh, in the air. Nero has persecuted the Christians very severely uh, in Rome, um, and persecution is going to be happening. The Christians, the Jewish Christians, um, seem to have escaped from Jerusalem uh, before its destruction, going to Pella is the tradition. Um, but it was always a possibility and would remain so um, really until the time of Constantine. Uh, it would be sporadic, but it was ever a possibility. If you were a Christian, um, you could be accused as such. And uh, if you wouldn't deny Christ, then you could be executed. Uh, we have the correspondence between Hadrian and Pliny the Younger. Um, telling us how Pliny, um, as a, a local governor, um, sought to find out how we should deal with Christians. The cross is absolutely central to Mark. Um, and Jesus will be in severe anguish in Gethsemane um, to his utterly alone, um, in close despair on the cross. Um, and this will speak powerfully to those who were facing uh, the questions. Why has God seemed to abandon me? Why is there no answer to God to my prayer? Why am I being asked to do these things? Mark wants to show that Jesus is with us in our times of trial. And if we stick with him, then we will triumph as he has triumphed. There is a reference to uh, persecution in the gospel um, in 1030. Um, I tell you, there's no one who has left, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or fields for my sake, and the sake of the good news will not receive a hundredfold um, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children, and fields, but with persecution, something which has been added to the text, it seems. Um, this is a reality of life for some people in Mark's community or those who will be listening to this gospel proclaimed. There's imagery of persecution and suffering of followers in chapter four, in uh, the parables. Um, um, things don't always go well, even though the final harvest will be abundant. And in chapter 13, we'll see how, how this works in a few moments time. Uh, there's talk of persecution and suffering of followers uh, within the eschatological discourse when Jesus announces that the temple will be destroyed. Very important in the gospel is Jesus predicting his own suffering. Three times um, uh, between Caesarea Philippi, where the first one occurs, um, and um, then on the journey towards Jerusalem, Jesus will predict his own suffering and the disciples will not understand a word that he's saying. Um, but Jesus will speak also that his, his followers will also suffer as he has suffered and the disciples don't understand a word. Even something like the storm at sea, um, where Jesus must rebuke his disciples for their fear and doubt, um, which of course in the time of persecution, there will be much fear and a great deal of doubting. Have faith is the message. In the world around, there has already been severe persecution of Christians. I just mentioned Peter um, and very likely Paul being executed during the persecutions of Nero uh, when things were really bad for um, 
the Christians who were blamed uh, by Nero for the great fire of Rome. Um, he first tried to blame the Jews, but that wouldn't wash. And therefore, since nobody liked the Christians, they um, were the scapegoats. And Tacitus uh, tells us every sort of derision was added to their deaths. They were wrapped in the skins of wild beasts and dismembered by dogs. Others were nailed to crosses. Others, when daylight failed, were set alight to serve as lamps by night. Hard world. Then the Jewish revolt. Um, and it may be that Mark, knowing the events of the destruction of Jerusalem, then prophesies in that um, 2020 vision way by prophesying after the event. Uh, or it may be that uh, he's simply well aware of what's going to happen um, once the Romans had moved in with force. Um, terror was ever their tactic. Mark's been described as a passion story with an extended introduction. Uh, Martin Kehler, a German scholar, said that in 1892, um, and he was speaking about all the synoptic gospels, but it particularly applies to Mark, the first gospel to be written. Why did uh, Mark um, think to write a gospel? Um, we can't be too sure, but the need to encourage people at a time of persecution May well have had something to do it, do with it. And then Matthew and Luke both follow the idea of a gospel, probably because they think Mark hasn't done it very well and they can do it a lot better. And indeed, uh, they probably think that they should displace Mark uh, with the quality of their work. Uh, and certainly in terms of uh, Greek, um, they do um, do a much better job than Mark, whose, whose Greek is... Um, is poor, um, but his style has an immediacy which is quite captivating. They both use him as a major source, um, though tidy him up considerably. And in some respects, I'll try and show, they don't really uh, understand what he's getting at. Um, his, um, perhaps his Greek style uh, hides the fact from them that he's actually something of a literary genius in terms of, of the way he tells his story. But lots of Mark is found in Matthew and Luke, and that led to Mark being forgotten about in, in many respects. Uh, it wasn't appreciated that his was the first gospel to be written. Um, uh, hence, he comes after Matthew in our New Testament. Um, it was thought for a long time that he had written a precy of Matthew, uh, which accounts for his second place. Um, but as a consequence, uh, until it was recognized that he, his was the first gospel and uh, he was uh, a major source for Matthew and Luke, he wasn't really looked at. Uh, and when he was, it was because he was thought to be closer to Jesus and therefore more historically accurate, but that's not really true either because of his literary genius. So let's go back now, right to the very beginning, um, to the first verse of the gospel. Um, we went through to the mixed citation, so we didn't uh, spend any time really on that uh, first sentence. Mark's first words, the beginning. This could apply just to the first 15 verses of um, the gospel. Um, that is the beginning of his work. But it's also the beginning of the good news. And the good news isn't simply confined to the words of the gospel, uh, to its 16 chapters and eight verses. The good news continues, and it continues right down to me talking to you uh, today. And that might explain the ending of Mark's gospel. Um, the clue to the ending might well be in the beginning. He ends abruptly. They, that's the women who have gone to the tomb to anoint Jesus and have met a man dressed in white, they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And there the gospel ends with the note of fear and with a preposition, which is not good English and is certainly not good Greek, uh, for the ending of a sentence or indeed for the end of a work. But in a sense, it's not an ending. The whole gospel is only a beginning which has to be continued. 
And if we were writing it today, we might end by saying to be continued and even put by you, dear listener or reader. The good news continues. This is just the beginning. The beginning of the good news of Jesus, of an objective and subjective unity, which means it's about Jesus, but it's also from Jesus. It is his good news in both ways. Jesus is simply a name common at the time, meaning God saves. Matthew explains that to us uh, in his first chapter. And then Christ, Christus from Christos, which is the translation of the Messiah of Hebrew, the Anointed One. There were many expectations of what was to happen in God's good time from the Jews of this period. An expectation for a Messiah, a son of David, who would be like David, a great military ruler and overthrow God's enemies. Um, being oppressed and occupied was not a good experience um, for any people and not for the people of Judah. Um, but there was also expectation of uh, a prophet like Moses, uh, a, a new priest to come, um, Elijah to return, lots of uh, expectations of which the coming of the Messiah was just one. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of God omitted in some ancient manuscripts, um, which um, is perplexing. Um, should it be there? Should it be omitted? Um, well, there's a good reason for having it in there, which we'll look at in a moment. Uh, but it has to be acknowledged that uh, in many ancient manuscripts and good manuscripts, uh, we don't find this phrase. All God's people are sometimes called God's sons, and uh, the king at the time of uh, the monarchy was also a God's son by adoption, uh, not um, to be thought of as divine, as was, for instance, the Pharaoh in Egypt. But Mark means something different. In calling Jesus Christ and Son of God, he's pointing to Christ's uh, being God's Christ being God's presence among us, as we've just seen. The Lord is returning to Zion. The Lord God, announced by Isaiah, is returning to Jerusalem, and uh, He is Jesus of Nazareth, the presence of God among His people. Now, these two titles, um, if we can surmise that they were both there from Mark's pen, give us a basic structure to the gospel, because the title Christ, which isn't used very much in the gospel, occurs again, round about the midpoint, when at Caesarea Philippi, uh, Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, and is told immediately to shut up, say nothing to anybody. He hasn't quite got it right because the Christ of expectations is not the Christ Jesus is to be. Then uh, the title Son of God comes when Jesus has died. He, the centurion, is the first human person uh, to say that Jesus is truly the Son of God, um, which may give us a basic structure of the gospel, a gospel of two halves. And if we look at the gospel, um, with that surmise, then we do see that the first part up to Caesarea Philippi is to do largely with public proclamation. Jesus will teach him in parables uh, in chapter four uh, and uh, to the people. It's more private teaching in the second part uh, up to his um, eschatological discourse when he's already in Jerusalem. And so looking very broadly at um, Mark's gospel, uh, after the introduction, the first 15 chapters, which is our concern uh, today, there's public teaching combined with controversy, arguments with the leaders of the people and rejection, rejection by the authorities who by chapter three are planning to how they can destroy him, rejection by his family, rejection by his townsfolk, uh, meanwhile, he's proclaiming uh, himself in word and in act to be the power of God um, through public teaching, miracles and controversy. Um, is his power in word and in the miracles and the great signs, his power in action. 
but he is growing more isolated through the controversies and projections and the disciples even in this first part of the gospel are repeatedly mis misunderstanding what he's about he will heal a blind man in parts the blind man will see but not quite clearly he can see human beings around but they look like trees walking and that's symbolic it's part of mark's literary skill uh, that he's talking much less about the blind man and much more about the disciples who are not seeing clearly at this stage indeed they won't uh, until the gospel is over in the second part of the gospel jesus will three times announce his passion uh, and death and resurrection um, and he will teach privately to the, to the disciples who continually fail to understand when we're on the edge of Jerusalem at Jericho, just about to ascend up this very steep incline um, to the holy city, Bartimaeus is healed and he is the perfect disciple. He knows who Jesus is, he won't be silenced, and importantly, he follows Jesus on the way. The way to Jerusalem, the way to the cross. After several controls in Jerusalem, we had this discourse, um, and then we're into the Passion uh, and Jesus' death, and then the late women go to the tomb. We can see Mark in terms of structure as um, a chiasm, which is sort of concentric circles. It comes from the Greek letter X, um, which uh, you're not going to see in the way I, I've put this, this round. If we go through the gospel, down and then up again, we get the idea that the introduction, the first 15 verses are much by the epilogue, the time at the tomb, uh, the visitation of the women, meeting the man in the tomb who's dressed in white. At the baptism, we'll come to shortly, the heavens are ripped apart. At Jesus' death, the veil of the temple ripped apart, the same very violent word is used. After the baptism, the first disciples are called before uh, Jesus trial, uh, arrest and trial, the disciples will all flee. There are controversies in Capernaum, matched by controversies in Jerusalem. Chapter 4 um, um, is um, Jesus' parables, and then miracles show his power over nature. And in this gathered discourse, uh, nature trembles, um, and there Jesus' power over evil and death um, relates to what's gone before and the sort of pivotal moment in a sense then is Peter's confession you are the Christ he's not right he has still a lot to learn um, as the healing of the blind man in parts suggests to us in terms of what to look for as we go through the gospel um, Mark is um, pretty primitive uh, in his style. Um, he likes the word and to begin sentences immediately is a very common adverb. Um, to keep the urgency um, in the gospel, he uses the historic present, um, which Luke and Matthew hate and get rid of um, nearly all of them. Um, he has what's known to scholars by the highly technical phrase, the Mark and Sandwich, which is um, an inclusion. Basically, Jesus, uh, Mark tells us something, um, then has the filling in the sandwich um, before coming back um, to what uh, this part of the story which was told earlier. So Jesus' relatives uh, seek him, um, and uh, then there's a break, they arrive. In that break, the scribes accuse Jesus of being in league with the devil. Jairus approaches Jesus, um, and Jesus will raise his daughter from the dead. Uh, but at the end point there, Jesus will be um, interrupted in his journey towards Jairus' house by the woman with the hemorrhage who will touch his cloak. Uh, the disciples are sent out. Uh, then we hear of the death of John the Baptist, and then the disciples come back. Uh, and the story goes on. And the fig tree is cursed. Um, Jesus goes into the temple and cleanses it and then the next day Peter realizes that the fig tree 
having been cursed, is now withered. Judas Tetra is announced, um, and then we have the anointing of Jesus at the house of Simon in Bethany, and then Judas actually goes to the chief priests um, to give whatever information he gave them, and they promise him money. So a common technique of Matthew, this inclusio um, and chiasm, as we've seen. So let's um, go to Jesus' baptism. So after the introduction to the gospel and uh, the quotation from Malachi and Isaiah, we've been introduced to John the Baptist and his baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then there is Jesus about to be baptized. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, that violent word, and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. We've got a reference to Isaiah. You will perhaps not be surprised to learn. Um, the heavens are torn apart and the spirit descends like a dove. And in Isaiah 64, so um, third uh, Isaiah, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Um, a, a wish um, expressed by the prophet to God to come down, having torn open the heavens, the heavens being the barrier between the realm of God above and our world below. Um, it's an oracle of lament and petition because the exile hadn't really gone as well as people would have hoped it to. And so God to do something definitive. Eschatological is to do with the eschaton, the end of time. So bring the end of time forward now, do something about it. We need something happening urgently. Um, for the barrier between uh, God and uh, we earthlings to be destroyed means that you know, there's, there's, there's no, uh, no mediation now. Uh, God coming down is among us. And we're going to get that same word, we'll refer to it, uh, Jesus' death, the veil of the temple is ripped into, meaning that uh, the area of God in the Holy of Holies, or at least within the temple, uh, is broken down. And so we have uh, the horizontal uh, barrier of the heavens being broken here, and later the vertical barrier of the curtain being torn down. Um, linking the baptism and the death of Jesus uh, and showing that the Lord among us is, is the one who opens the way for us uh, to be at one with God and God to be at one with us. The spirit comes down like a dove, which could be a reference to uh, Noah sending out a dove after the flood, new creation, new beginnings. Um, but uh, perhaps it's also a reference to the great new beginning at creation, when the spirit, the breath, the ruach of God uh, uh, hovered over the waters. Um, it's an image of, of something bird-like in God's breath, God's spirit. Um, that perhaps is what we're intended to think of here. God speaks, speaking of his son, his beloved son. A reference in part to Psalm 2, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Uh, a psalm linked with the enthronement of a king. Uh, and in the psalm itself, the nations are revolting against the Lord God. Um, and God responds, affirming the king as his son um, by adoption. Um, and a warning in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the psalm, serve the Lord and give proper homage to his anointed. Uh, that's the instruction that Mark is wanting us to understand. The beloved son was also, of course, Isaac to Abraham. And so we might have here an allusion to the Akedah, the, the binding of Isaac, which uh, Christians tend to call the sacrifice, in inverted commas, because... Isaac wasn't sacrificed. Um, and if that's so, then 
perhaps we're getting an early glimpse of what is to come in terms of um, Jesus' sacrifice, which will indeed take place. Um, in spirituality, Isaac carrying the wood for the sacrifice was uh, oftentimes linked to Jesus carrying the cross. But there's also a link, uh, again, you will not be surprised to know, um, to Isaiah, chapter 42. So we're back at the, towards the beginning of second Isaiah. Um, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen whom my soul delights, um, with whom I am well pleased. I put my spirit upon him, spirit coming down from the dove, you'll bring forth justice to the nations. Um, the servant motif is so important in second Isaiah and indeed in our understanding of Jesus and in all likelihood, Jesus' understanding of Jesus himself, his mission and his ministry. Now, if we look at the various accounts of John's baptism of Jesus in the Jordan, we will be struck by the awkwardness that three of the evangelists feel about this event. In Matthew, there's a little conversation before the baptism takes place. John doesn't want it to happen. No, no, no. I need to be baptized by you. You come to me. Let it be so now, Jesus says. But it's proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Whatever that might mean. In Luke, we have the amazing slight of pinship. Um, John isn't on the scene at the time of the baptism. Amazing, but true. Because of the old evil things that Herod had done, adding to them all by shutting up John in prison, we hear. Now, when all the people were baptized, when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened. So John's in prison. And we hear about Jesus' baptism. Um, and the heavens open and everything happens after the baptism itself. But you'd think John wasn't there. And in the fourth gospel, John, whose task is to testify, he came as a witness, a witness to the light we hear in the prologue. And after the prologue, we see John and hear John testifying uh, to those uh, important people who come from Jerusalem. And then a little bit later, he testifies. That's his role. I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. So we get John's report. We don't get the actual baptism in the fourth gospel. So why are they so awkward and embarrassed by it? Well, who's more important? The one who first arrives on the scene or the one who was Johnny come lately? Hmm. John was baptizing and his voice, the voice, the very first voice, prophetic voice to be heard in 500 years he called as it were Jesus from far away Nazareth in Galilee Jesus came to John who is the greater and this is Matthew's awkwardness the one who is doing the baptizing or the one who is receiving the baptism clearly John rates much higher in all these but then John's baptism, we've been told, is a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. How does that square with Jesus being without sin? It seems that before he begins his ministry, he needs to be washed clean. Hmm. And John was enormously popular. Um, Josephus will tell us that uh, uh, Herod had arrested John and subsequently, of course, killed him. Um, because he was worried about the crowds. A despot does not like uh, large crowds led by charismatic leaders. We see that in our world today. And so Josephus says Herod took him out, as it were, with a pre preemptive strike. But Mark doesn't have any sort of embarrassment. He just tells it straight. Uh, Jesus came from Nazareth, but was baptized and... When he was baptized, um, these things happened. The spirit descending, the voice from heaven. It's a very straightforward story. There's no sign of any embarrassment or any awkwardness. This is simply how it happened. Why did Mark not have 
any embarrassment. We have to, I think, almost you know, wonder how a child might paint the picture. The people come along weighed down by sin, so they're all dirty and scummy and, and uh, looking bedraggled. John dunks them in the water, their sins are removed, washed away. So where do the sins go? The sins go into the water and the people come out clean, unburdened, um, looking pristine. Jesus, we've already been told, is God coming among us. The good news of Isaiah is that God is returning to his people and there is Jesus. So Jesus is identified as Lord, as Lord God. So we need not worry about him being sinful. Um, that's not the point of his baptism. All the others come to have their sins washed away. Jesus doesn't. Jesus comes as one who is clean, who steps into the dirty waters. If you're dirty and get into the bath, you come out clean. If you're clean and get into a bath where the dirt of everybody else has been left behind, you're going to come out dirty. Jesus, the one who bears our sins. And we go back to those texts we saw in the prophet Isaiah. He is the one who takes on our sins. And the whole of the rest of the story uh, of Mark's gospel will be Jesus accepting the consequences of sin right to the very end. He has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him lies the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Immediately. Mark loves the word immediately, as we've seen. The me and, uh, another great word for Mark, and the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Another very harsh term, which Matthew and Luke don't realise the importance. They simply say the Spirit led Jesus. They don't like the idea of Jesus being driven anywhere, but it's a really crucial word for Mark. And we have to ask who or what was driven into the wilderness. We go back to the most solemn day of the Jewish calendar, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. On this great and solemn day, two goats were chosen, and chosen because they looked alike, and lots were drawn. And one goat was allotted to the Lord, and that goat was sacrificed, and its blood taken by the high priest into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled on the mercy seat. While the mercy seat was there after the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians um, and its restoration by Zerubbabel, then it was simply an empty room. This was the only occasion when the high priest ever entered the Holy of Holies, when anybody ever entered the Holy of Holies, um, clouded with incense. And there it is said the high priest used the personal name of God. The high priest, not in his great regalia on this occasion, but dressed in a white linen garment as a slave. Entering the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, where God's name was present from the time of the dedication by Solomon. Great temple deconstruction um, and be and only the priests were allowed in the temple and only the high priest into the Holy of Holies, where was the Ark of the Covenant, uh, a golden gilded box in which were the tablets of stone um, given to the Lord God to Moses and a piece of manna, uh, it was said, all lost after the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. Another artist's impression, Moses Nairon, where the, um, the cherubim uh, wings are touching 
as um, is described in the book of Leviticus. Now the second goat was allotted to Azazel, the high priest having laid his hands on the goat's head to place his sins, the sins of his family, the sins of the nation on the goat, which was then driven out of the camp into the wilderness to Azazel. What then, or who was Azazel? For some, it was a demon of the desert. Um, and uh, that could be significant uh, in Mark's gospel, as we'll see in a few moments' time. For some, it simply means to its destruction that it was basically led over the edge of a cliff uh, to die. But there's an analogous um, temple ritual for the cleansing of lepers when one bird is sacrificed and a second bird is released to fly wherever it wishes. So maybe the goat was just sent away. But also, Azazel, quite literal translation, is the goat who escapes, which in Tyndale's translation of the Bible became the scapegoat because the E in Old English was dropped. So it's the goat that's let go, the goat that escapes, giving us the whole idea of one who bears the sins uh, of others or suffers on behalf of others. So Jesus, bearing our sins from his baptism in the Jordan, is driven into the wilderness, there to do battle with the forces of evil. Remember that first meaning of Azazel. And he wins the battle. We're told he's with the wild animals, which might be a reference just to a scary place, but it might also be a reference to the Garden of Eden, where the wild animals weren't that wild. Uh, again, remember Isaiah and chapter 11, uh, where the lion lies down with the lamb because all animals in the Garden of Eden were herbivores, not a carnivore to be had. But we're told, crucially, the angels minister to him. Ministering, serving is going to be a crucial concept in the Gospels, and uh, therefore in Mark. Uh, the angels minister God to, to God. That's the job of the angels, is to minister to God, and here they minister to him because he survived the ordeal. In a sense, that's the whole gospel story. Jesus bears our sins. He does battle with the and forces of, of, of demons, uh, of wickedness, and he succeeds. And so he came to Galilee, and Jesus' ministry proper is now to begin. It begins after John was handed over, um, imprisoned. Um, but the word handed over... Um, will be used uh, when Jesus comes to his arrest and passion. He'll be handed over and over and over. John was Jesus' mentor. Of that, there seems to be little doubt. It wasn't just Jesus passed by and was baptized, um, that he was with John and learned from John. And indeed, at the beginning of his ministry, imitated John. Um, so that people like Herod can think, this is John, come back from the dead. And what happens to John, the mentor, shows us what's going to happen to Jesus, the pupil. The time has been fulfilled, kairos, a decisive moment in time. History is coming to its completion. The reign of God has come near. God is ruling, um, is what that means. The kingdom of God, often translated, but it's, it's God's actual ruling, uh, which is being evoked. Remember Isaiah, your God reigns. The reign of God is coming about, present among us in the person of Jesus, but it will not be anything as we might have expected. And the message, repent, to do with the Greek word metanoete, which means change the way you look at things. Change your mind and heart. Change your perceptions. Look at things in a different way and believe the good news. Remember the opening of the gospel, the beginning of the good news. Now we're going to um, have that little inclusio. We're ending where we began this first part uh, of the gospel, which in a sense is a beginning, but the whole thing is going to be a beginning. And the good news is that God is coming to his people He's here among us in the person of Jesus. And so believing in the good news is to believe in Jesus and to act accordingly.
which will be the way of service and the way of the cross, as we will hear as the gospel continues.